Hello everyone. So our topic for discussion for today happens to be centered around speech comprehension and also recognizing its deficits. So we're going to look at Wernicke's aphasia as well. So beginning with trying to understand what is speech comprehension. Speech comprehension has two aspects to it. The first one is recognition of words. The second one is comprehension of words. Sometimes we feel recognition and comprehension are both the same, but we need to realize that they are two distinct aspects when we come to the brain. Okay, So the brain kind of processes it at two distinct levels. So let's look at recognition first. Recognition is basically a perceptual you know process which involves memory of you know different sounds on the other hand the brain regions involved are the middle and posterior superior temporal gyrus so which is indicated with the red mark in this you know animated figure so this region is also called as the Wernicke's area so the perceptual task which is involved in recognition is primarily dealing with the phonemes uh, which makes you know different sounds of you know different alphabets being able to perceive it as a holistic word all of that deals with recognition the next aspect is comprehension so when we are looking at comprehension comprehension basically is nothing but understanding the meaning of different words and with regards to brain regions there are varied brain regions that are responsible for comprehension as we you know go through the slides we will be able to get to know this a little better so now we're going to look at what Wernicke's aphasia is all about. So Wernicke's aphasia, it is a form of aphasia wherein there is poor speech comprehension. But however, the client is able to talk fluently but in an absolutely meaningless speech. So the client is able to use function words. Uh, the client is also able to use a few content words. If you're wondering what function and content words are, the previous video on Broca's aphasia will help you explain what are function and content words. Also, we can notice that the grammatical structure in which the clients actually talk is perfectly intact, but we need to understand that, you know, they absolutely make no sense. Okay, so the sentences absolutely, absolutely don't make sense and they all also demonstrate you know poor comprehension abilities so for example say you show them uh, you know a bunch of stationaries and then you ask them can you please point out the object that you know has uh, ink in it so we uh, we would rightly point out say uh, the pen here and then the pen here okay so but a person with Wernicke's aphasia will be unable to do so because they cannot really understand what you're trying to say but we need to know that they it's not that they can't hear you okay they can hear you but it's just that they cannot understand okay so the, they do not have necessarily you know uh, deficits with with regards to hearing okay so with regards to you know other aspects when you're looking at Wernicke's aphasia we need to know that they are absolutely unaware of this deficit that they hold okay but you know, they also have a few things that are noticed wherein they are able to take their turns in conversations for example if someone's talking they would remain quiet you know and when the other person stops talking they will begin talking so all that happens and also they are very sensitive to facial expression so suppose someone's really crying in front of them they realize okay yeah, something's wrong they are upset okay so they are kind of sensitive to facial expression so as we can see in Wernicke's aphasia other aspects are really intact it's just that a uh, comprehension has been completely impaired so we're looking at Wernicke's aphasia in detail like an analysis of it we can you know come to a conclusion conclusion that it is characterized as a receptive aphasia as it is mainly predominantly centered on comprehension 
financial deficits. We can also say that Wernicke's area also specifically recognizes sounds of words. Okay, that is also one thing that researchers kind of point out. So keeping all of this in mind, what are the chief deficits that you can actually notice in Wernicke's aphasia? We can notice that individuals with Wernicke's aphasia uh, you know find it hard to recognize spoken words they also find it hard to comprehend the meaning of spoken words and they also find it hard to convert their thoughts into words so these are areas of pure deficits when it comes to Wernicke's aphasia so Wernicke's aphasia has you know associated symptoms to it okay so all of these symptoms are you know under Wernicke's aphasia so which involves regions not only you know the Wernicke's area but also other brain regions are also involved in Wernicke's aphasia so when you keep that in mind we we need to understand that these symptoms okay when you look at it as a unitary context it can happen because of damage to certain regions and the person may not have Wernicke's aphasia as such okay so when we are discussing the symptoms we might be looking at other disorders or associated conditions also and we will also be considering how it holistically constitutes Wernicke's aphasia so keeping that in mind we are gonna first begin with understanding recognition okay so with regards to recognition the deficit of the same is pure word deafness okay so again to review recognition is a perceptual task and comprehension however requires additional information from memory and other sources so when there is a damage to the left temporal lobe okay so this region predominantly will cause an individual to have pure word deafness okay so what is this issue okay pure word deafness happens when an individual is unable to recognize words or speech sounds okay so what really happens here is they can hear you talk but they cannot recognize what you're saying okay so that's one thing that happens so they can however recognize non-speech sounds for example the dog barking the doorbell the birds chirping all of these sounds they can recognize but speech sounds for example like what I'm talking to you right now will be something that they cannot really recognize recognize okay you need to understand that they can however recognize emotions okay they can understand emotions okay they can understand emotions based on speech intonation the ups and downs for example when you're very angry so the tone goes really loud okay and really high okay say when you're very sad it gets very low okay so depending upon the tone you can judge whether a person's angry or sad or anxious so all of that is intact so the person can understand you know uh, speech intonation and can in, in a way God's emotions in and through it okay however you need to also know that their, their speech is comprehensible for example what they speak is something that you can understand so that is with regards to pure word deafness okay so how do they compensate for it so sometimes you can notice that they engage in lip reading that is when they talk something okay suppose you're talking to them okay they will look at your lips keenly and try to figure out what you're actually trying to say okay and on the other hand they also you know can read and write okay so which means they ask you to often talk to them you know in a written form so that they are able to communicate in writing and they can read and understand what you're trying to say so this is with regards to pure word deafness so conclusively we can say that pure in pure word deafness the client is unable to recognize speech sounds but the comprehension part when it comes to reading writing all of that is evident okay so then what happened was researchers were keen on understanding what's really happening with regards to speech sounds so they found out that when there are speech sounds for example a host of words presented to them okay it kind of activates the auditory association cortex of the superior temporal gyrus which is also the word uh, you know Wernicke's area okay so these regions tend to be activated when there are speech sounds okay so it was noticed that 
that this these regions kind of activate you know when there are speech sounds you equally both in the left hemisphere as well as the right hemisphere so what really happens here is uh, this is the region if you're unable to locate it okay the auditory association area is right here so the client is able to analyze the sounds you know of speech very easily and this particular region gets activated during the process however say you know the speech gets distorted slowly and you begin to you know give them non speech like sounds you will notice that this region gets a lower activity spot in the fmri scan so this clearly proves that you know for speech sounds in order for speech sounds to require activity in brain region this is the predominant brain region that activate uh, that you know actively involves in speech sounds which is found to be damaged in pure word deafness so with regards to other aspects uh, that is the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere we can notice that a researchers kind of point out of left hemisphere to be involved in a uh, components of rapidly changing complex sounds okay so for example right now as i'm talking to you so that's like a rapid changing complex sounds there are different sounds ups and downs and slow and fast and you know it goes really fast right more than slow it goes really fast your speech is mostly in a very fast manner okay so that is with regards to rapidly changing complex sounds on the other hand the right hemisphere is kind of involved in slowly changing uh, you know components of sound for example a melody uh, you know a mel melodious song or something like that okay so we need to know that timing is very crucial it's a very crucial aspect of speech sounds okay so on the whole speech sounds are uh, you know kind of convey the identity of words and these you know speech sounds are absolutely very very brief okay so we need to also know that the those that convey you know prosody which is em emphasis or emotions all of that is a little you know longer in duration compared to speech sounds which are very brief okay so on the whole we can say that the left hemisphere is predominantly involved in recognition of you know such short duration speech sound so when it comes to talking we can be very clear and specific of the left hemisphere being very much responsible with identifying and recognizing speech sounds so when we are looking at pure word deafness and vowels and consonants there is another aspect to it okay so when there is a damage to the you know left hemisphere's auditory association cortex which is which is always so in pure word deafness we notice that these individuals find it you know very hard to identify you know stop consonants and they generally find it hard to identify consonants but they find it much more harder to identify stop consonants for example t d k or p okay so words like stop dead okay all of that is really hard for them to identify on the ha other hand you know consonants of longer duration like s z f is something that they can a little bit identify so this is uh, this this can be really obvious because uh, this is done by the right hemisphere on the other hand we can also say conclusively that the major symptom here in pure word deafness is the difficulty in recognition of speech sounds and uh, they can however recognize certain environmental sounds okay so basically in pure word deafness the brain regions that we can conclude conclusively is that that could be two major regions involved one is that can be disruptions to the auditory input in the wernicke's area so that can be because of damage in the primary auditory area so that is right here okay so when there is a damage to this region it can stop you know uh, Wernicke's area from receiving innervation so that could be one reason of you know pure word deafness or it could also be because of damage of white matter in the temporal lobe okay so which can also lead to 
pure word deafness okay on the other hand it can also be directly just a damage to Wernicke's area so which can also cumulatively lead to pure word deafness so next we're gonna look at comprehension so with regards to comprehension we are looking at the deficits of the same also and that will be transcortical sensory aphasia so the characteristic feature when we are looking at Wernicke's aphasia deals with comprehension deficits so deficits in comprehension can show up in two ways one is the failure to comprehend meaning of words and another one is inability to express thoughts in a very meaningful manner so for it for this to occur we need to understand that damage must extend beyond the Wernicke's area so the Wernicke's area is here denoted by this color here uh, the teal orange color okay so damage must extend beyond the Wernicke's area in order for such deficits to actually show up so when we are looking at beyond Wernicke's area for the case for the sake of convenience we are gonna call this uh, region which is a uh, pinkish red this region we're gonna call it as the posterior language area okay so this is just for identity purposes so we can see that the posterior language area basically you know surrounds the posterior end of the lateral fissure and it also serves like a junction for the temporal occipital as well as the parietal lobes so this region basically the posterior la language area region basically serves two purposes and one is it serves the auditory representation of words and on the other hand it also serves as the meaning of words like different meanings of words are also stored here as memories so this region is very important when it comes to speech comprehension so with regards to damage okay so when we are looking at damage so when there is a damage to posterior language area it can actually lead to a condition called transcortical sensory aphasia so with this this particular aphasia can happen even without damage to the Wernicke, Wernicke's area all right so such individuals what are their features so such individuals cannot understand or recognize words so they neither can recognize words nor understand them so say you say to them lampstand they can repeat the word lampstand but they cannot comprehend what they have heard or what they have just said so so this means that they cannot produce meaningful speech of their own so now your confusion might be but how can they actually repeat so let's get into details of their repetition so with regards to their repetition it is uh, it is found by research that that there is a direct connection with the Broca's area so the posterior language area seems to be directly connected to the Broca's area which is involved in speech production so this direct connection with Broca's area can indicate or be indicative of the following one is Broca's area is actually involved in speech production which in turn leads to repetition whereas Wernicke's area which is intact is very much involved in recognizing sounds so together it enables them to repeat okay so that's why in transcortical sensory aphasia though they can cannot comprehend what they are saying they still engage in repetition so thus we can conclusively say Wernicke's aphasia together as of now constitutes both pure word deafness as well as transcortical sensory aphasia so which means a client with Wernicke's aphasia cannot understand cannot repeat as well as cannot recognize speech sounds so the next thing that we're gonna look at is meaning so meaning as in we are going to look at comprehension so what exactly you know is comprehension comprehension requires meanings of different words objects actions and their relationships so for example say it is you know the word tree okay so as soon as i say the word tree what happens in your mind you get 
you know physical characteristics of how a tree looks say it is a large tree with a lot of leaves with a lot of branches so that's the physical characteristics of how it looks you also kind of feel uh, you know here auditory aspects of a tree for example of how uh, you know when a wind blows on a tree how does it sound like when you're standing under it okay so all of that is auditory aspects to it and sensory aspects to it is for example the feeling you get when you touch the bark or touch the leaf okay all of that is the sensory aspects to it we need to understand that when comprehension is involved okay so meaning of objects words actions or you know the nouns or whatever it may be it does not only involve the primary speech areas but it involves involves varied or different parts of the brain in this case with regards to comprehension the major regions being the association cortexes of various various uh, regions of the cerebral cortex so together as soon as you hear a word all of these regions get activated so that's why uh, you know when you are looking at comprehension it is important to know that comprehension is not singled out to a single region but it involves a lot of varied other regions of the brain so now let's move on to understand the analogy of verbal mechanisms of the brain you know with regards to comprehension by comparing it to a dictionary so what's in a dictionary in a dictionary you find two things and one is word entries and the other one is meaning so with regards to the brain the word entries here are gonna look like sounds and look Looks, that is sounds of words looks as in say it's a written word and you see it so that's the looks okay so with regards to the brain this is how it works okay so first thing is there is an entry so the word entry comes in through sounds and the way a word looks okay so comprehension which involves different brain regions okay also happens wherein varied regions in the association cortex tend to be activated so let's look at sequence of sound so what happens when speech sound recognition takes place in your brain okay so when there is a sound typically it tends to activate you know the recognition regions of your brain for for which it is the Wernicke's area in this case okay and then the memories of the word meaning tend to be activated and this could be all across the brain you know in different varied different and varied regions all around the association cortexes so basically when you are looking at speech sound the sound is recognized through the Wernicke's area whereas comprehension happens across the brain now on the other way if you are looking at production okay so say you want to say it it happens in reverse so the reverse here would be the visual association cortex enables you to have a visual image of what you want to say and then it in turn activates the posterior language area which in turn gives you the a representation of words or the meaning of the words that you have to put across and then in turn the message is transferred on to the Broca's area which leads to grammatical sentences and pronunciation of the actual word so this is with regards to speech so speech is the exact reverse of speech sound recognition so the next thing that we're gonna look at is the proofs for different brain regions for comprehension so till now we are trying to help you uh, understand that comprehension primarily involves different brain regions and is very distinct from recognition so keeping that in mind we are going to look at several other proofs with regards to comprehension the first proof being the left I'm sorry the right parietal lobe so with regards to the right parietal lobe say there is a damage in the right parietal lobe it is noticed that it affects spatial perception so there was a woman with a damage to her right parietal lobe so because of damage to her right parietal lobe she had a few features okay so one thing was she did not have any signs of aphasia okay but however 
she was very confused about directions and spatial relationships so basically she can point out you know to objects but she cannot say spatially where they are located for example if you ask her ceiling she can point out to the ceiling or if you tell her point out to the floor she can point out to the floor but she cannot really say what is above or what is below so that is the condition wherein the right parietal lobe is damaged okay so uh, so she cannot really understand the meanings of spatial relations words okay so for example words like up down under all of this that denote spatial relationships she was unable to really comprehend them but on the other hand she she was able to use words normally okay in in a non spatial way for example the same words that can be used also spatially she was unable to use them when it denoted a spatial relationship but she was able to use the same words when they denoted non spatial relationships for example i am going up and the same up is here in i feel like throwing up so the up here in i am going up denotes a spatial relationship of a direction whereas i feel like throwing up has nothing to do with spatial relationships so with regards to you know right parietal lobe damage we can conclude that you know with regards to speech they are primarily reserved for comprehending spatial relationships next we are going to look at the left parietal lobe so with regards to left parietal lobe it is found that when there is a damage in the association cortex which is right here okay as you can see it in the in the image so the association cortex when there is a damage to the association cortex of the left parietal lobe the person goes through a disorder called as autotopagnosia okay so this disorder is characterized by an inability to point out or you know name their own body parts or body parts in general but however they you know don't have any other deficits okay they can you know talk other talk about other words very normally but when you ask them to point out to their own body parts they kind of find it really hard so that is with regards to the left parietal lobe the next thing that we're going to be discussing is with regards to categories of meaning with regards to categories of meaning we're going to be discussing the case study of client tb so he had a damage on the left temporal lobe as highlighted in the image in the screen so when there was a damage for this client in the left temporal lobe it left the client with an inability to explain living things that is he was unable to define living things so how was this deficit manifested is that say you show him uh, i'm sorry not show say you ask him okay give the definition of pen so he will be able to define it absolutely very easily without any you know fear or without any kind of hardship so for example he would go on to say that it has a refill it is used for writing on a paper so things like that okay so he will find it absolutely easy to do it but on the other hand say you ask him to define a dog he will find it really hard to define a dog he will find it really hard to even understand what you're trying to say on the other hand say you show him a picture of a dog and ask him to define it he will be able to do so without any difficulty which means he goes on to talk about the breed goes on to talk about you know other features and everything related to it that he knows he would go on to explain so basically there is something that we got to understand with you know this particular case study and that is there are certain key features that you know with regards to comprehension comprehension that seems to be distributed all across the brain so when you're looking at the case of patient tb we can actually look at it and come to a conclusion that patient tb's brain regions that involve visually perceiving objects and living things and comprehending the same 
are perfectly intact. On the other hand, auditory comprehension of living things are not intact. So that's why when you ask the client to you know define the dog he was not able to do so but when you showed the picture and asked the client to define what is a dog he was able to do so so conclusions can be that different brain regions are involved in the comprehension of different categories of words so this is also proved through different fmri studies that kind of highlight different regions being activated for different categories of words like furnitures food animals etc so research also further evidence that you know right hemisphere kind of demonstrates activation when there are certain things like abstract concepts or when it involves metaphors where it involves moral of the story understanding proverbs so all of that you know uh, highlights right hemispheric activity so basically comprehension seems to be distributed all across the brain and we can't really isolate it to a single brain structure the next thing that we're gonna look at is repetition and the deficits of the same being conduction aphasia so as we already discussed about how an individual with transcortical sensory aphasia can repeat what he or she hears due to direct connection of Wernicke's area with the Broca's area. We are now looking at how this happens. So basically considering how this happens, we need to get ourselves familiar with a bundle of axons called the arcuate fasci cellis. So arcuate fasci cellis is nothing but a bundle of axons that seems to convey speech sounds. I repeat, it is a bundle of axons that seems to convey speech sounds. So it conveys speech sounds from the Bro Wernicke's area to the Broca's area and you this the bundle of axons is highlighted this way all right so with regards to this there are certain you know cases wherein there is a damage to this region and we're going to look at what really happens when there is a damage so one such condition is conduction aphasia so when there is a damage in the connection of the Wernicke's area and the Broca's uh, to the Broca's area, it can cause a condition called the uh, the conduction aphasia. So, people with conduction aphasia, their features predominantly, you know, involve. Uh, they can speak very free very fluently. Their speech will be comprehensible. They can repeat speech sounds, but they cannot repeat speech sounds that they do not understand so here is the clutch okay so basically they can repeat speech sounds that they can understand but they cannot repeat speech sounds that they cannot understand so you may now look confused as i was stating that arcuate fasci cell is kind of convey sounds uh, speech sounds so let us you know look at what are the underlying phenomenon behind conduction aphasia in order to understand this a little better we need to understand this bundle of axons a little better so arcuate fasci cell is basically it conveys word sounds so what it does not convey is it does not convey meanings on the other hand it can be used for unfamiliar words for example say you're learning a new language so at that point it is this region that conveys the sounds of that particular word in order that you produce you know you know that word in your mouth so when you're learning new languages or when you're learning new words it is the accurate fasci cellist that plays a major role so on the other hand what really happens in conduction aphasia is the client can convey meaningful speech sounds however the client cannot convey non-meaningful speech sounds so repetition we were looking at our clause for repetition so the problem was the client cannot repeat speech sounds that the client cannot understand but they can repeat speech sounds that you know they are able to understand so how is that possible so in conduction aphasia repetition is not possible for non-meaningful speech sounds because there is a damage to the arcuate fasci cellus all right because the arcuate fasci cellus conveys speech sounds of 
unfamiliar words. On the other hand, they can convey meaningful speech sound because it is processed through other sources or other regions of the brain. So that is with regards to understanding conduction aphasia. So when you're giving a word to a client with conduction aphasia, you will notice that the word kind of activates the respective meaning centers of the brain and the client kind of imagines the word and there is an imagery found and then they will end up describing it like how one would put their thoughts in to action so keeping all of this in mind we we need to know that there is a role that accurate fasci cellus plays in short-term memories of words so basically connection between the Wernicke's area that you can see out here and the Broca's area kind of plays a very important role in short-term memories of words and speech sounds so by short-term memories of words we are looking at rehearsals okay so when you are rehearsing say a new word which you've never heard before say biscos so biscos is a word say you've never heard before so you're trying to rehearse it because your your friend says you have to remember this till I get back or something like that so in that in that situation what really happens is you when you imagine saying the word Broca's area gets activated and while you're imagining hearing the word your auditory association area of the temporal lobe basically gets activated so this kind of forms the phonological loop which is obviously your arcuate fasci cellus so basically this phonological loop goes back and forth back and forth and enables you to be able to remember the word so it plays an important role in the short-term memory of speech sounds okay so this was further confirmed through varied research studies so we're going to look at the study one in this research what happened was participants were shown uh, six sets of consonant like words okay like you can see as displayed in the screen and and then they were asked to remember it and after that they while they were trying to remember it their brain went through an fmri scan so what were the impressions the impressions was there was activation in the Broca's area that you can see out here as well as the posterior language area that is highlighted in the violet color out here so basically confirming the phonological loop so when they were trying to recall it these two regions were actually having an activation so which means there was an activation because of the phonological loop the next thing that what uh, the other study that we're going to look at is basically something that is similar to the previous study but in this study the participants were shown a set of pronounceable pseudo words pseudo words are words that look like words sound like words but are not really words that carry meaning okay so for example one toy nep okay so all these words words of these sort were shown a whole lot of words not just three okay were shown and then they were asked to remember it so while trying to remember it for 40 seconds their brain went through a pet scan so the results of the scan was that high performers ended up having a lot of Broca's area being activated whereas low performers had a lot of occipital regions of the brain being act activated so why do you think they were high performers and why do you think they were low performers so Broca's area was activated indicating that the subjects were trying to convey sounds okay so Accurate fasci cellus is very useful for short-term memory and rehearsal of, you know, unfamiliar words such as this. So that's why they were able to recall a lot more than individuals who are trying to attach meaning to it through imagery. So when they were attaching meaning through it to it through imagery, it cannot really pass through the accurate fasci cellus to Broca's area because meanings do not really pass through the accurate fasci cellus, but sounds do. So thus again confirming the phonological loop of arcuate fasci cellus so with this we come to an end of our discussion of Wernicke's aphasia and uh, you know speech production on the whole so I hope you have understood all the concepts that has been taught to you through this session and if you have any doubts kindly notify thank you